there this we go. This meeting is being recorded. This meeting is, yes, it is. So it's good for review and to share if people don't get to come to the actual event, um, which would be terrific. So uh, my name is Eric Luther, and I'm here with Michaela from the Pulitzer Center. And she's going to take the lead and really tell us about it, Michaela Schmidt. And she's going to take the lead and tell us all about the program. Um, we're hoping to have Dylan Ortiz, who was our uh, fellowship grantee from last year, with us in a few minutes to talk about his experience. Um, let me see, I've got some more people coming in, so let's see, maybe they're there. Uh, not yet, but some more people. So that's the plan. And uh, Michaela, whenever you're ready, I'll let you I'll let you take the lead. Great, yeah, well, I will just go ahead and get into things, but um, of course, as people join, I'm happy to have more. Um, so yeah, hi everyone, my name is Michaela Schmidt. As Eric mentioned, I am a program coordinator on our campus and outreach team. So I work with Libby and Kem and our reporting fellows team to select applicants, support them throughout their reporting, as well as organize campus visits, um, and get to do lots of great work with our campus consortium partnership. So today I'm gonna to tell you a little bit about what our student fellowship is, um, some of the benefits that you gain from the experience, and go through some of the requirements and application details. And can everyone see my screen okay? Perfect. Great. Well, first, I just want to start off with a bit of an overview of what the Pulitzer Center is. Um, so you'll see on the screen there, this is our mission statement. So we are a journalism nonprofit focused on raising awareness of underreported global issues. Um, so this essentially means that we work to fund journalists who wouldn't otherwise have the funding to tell these stories. Um, and we really encourage them to focus on investigative um, underreported issues. So we try to send them to the field for longer periods of time than maybe a normal newsroom could fund them um, and give them support in the area, in the region, connect them with other journalists, um, just to make sure that we're producing quality long form journalism um, that tells the stories of communities that might otherwise not be told. And then the other key component of our mission is our education and outreach. So our work to bring that journalism to the community um, and to our students that we partner with through our campus consortium program, as well as our K through 12 partnership. So the Pulitzer Center Reporting Fellowship is a piece of our campus consortium partnership with universities. It's an opportunity to tell an underreported story and gain valuable journalism experience. Um, so if you were to receive the reporting fellowship, you'd receive a stipend of $3,000 to cover your reporting costs and be able to travel locally or internationally to report on the topic of your choosing. You would also get to join the Pulitzer Center Network, which includes our network of professional grantees, as well as our reporting fellow alums. The great thing about our reporting fellow program is that not everyone is journalists in it. So our alums do a wide range of things. We have doctors, lawyers, all sorts of people studying all sorts of different fields, not just journalism, but they took this opportunity and used it to understand how to communicate more effectively with the public um, and communicate about what they're working on. So you'll also get connected with that wonderful network as well. And then we'll also help put, push out your reporting through outreach opportunities. So we love to have our student fellows participate in campus visits, um, film festivals, virtual events, all sorts of different things. So you'll see on the screen here, this is our cohort of 2022 reporting fellows. In 2022, we had 54 fellows from 40 network partners. And you'll see Dylan, who is Westchester's 2022 fellow in there as well. And, and uh, this Michaela, Dylan has joined us, by the way. So he is here. Great. Perfect. Thank and you, I Dylan. Think, I think Dylan has to leave by 1130, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so yes, we might want to keep that, keep that in mind. Perfect. Yeah, I'll go I didn't at 11.30. But I'm um, happy to be here. Great. <laughs> so yeah, these are um, some of the locations that our fellows went to last year to report. It was a really exciting year last year because we finally got to really focus back in on international travel, which for COVID, we had to do some adapting with. Um, so you can see that we had a whole range of students who are reporting both in the U.S. and on lots of different continents. Mm -hmm. um, and it was great to have the opportunity for students to explore what was best for them. And then finally, there's the Reporting Fellow community. Um, it's a really great opportunity to meet lots of students from our campus consortium partners across the country. 
Um, we do what's called Washington Weekend in October, which we like to consider the culmination of the reporting fellowship. So we host all of our student fellows in DC for the weekend. They all present on their reporting projects. They get to hear from professional journalists. And there are also just lots of fun things. Like we did a scavenger hunt across the mall in DC. Um, so just getting to explore the city, getting to know each other. Um, so we really treasure that weekend. It's a really great opportunity for all the fellows to connect and make these lifelong um, lasting connections. We also like to do um, reunions, whether you're in the DC area or not. So we've done virtual reunions as well as some in-person ones, which is always just a great opportunity to connect to the staff, see where our fellows are now a couple years post-grad, what they're up to. Um, we always love to stay in touch. And then we also do things like virtual film festivals, um, have our fellows speak at conferences, and participate in campus visits with other students. So as I mentioned, Washington Weekend is one of our favorite parts of the Reporting Fellowship. So I want to share a brief video from our 2022 um, weekend. And let me know if you can hear this. We are celebrating the culmination of, for some of us, the end of our reporting journey. Some of us haven't gone yet. Just coming together and presenting all of our projects, the work that we've done, what we've learned, why our stories are important. The Pulitzer Center was, first of all, a dream opportunity. It was something I had my eyes set on since I came to Syracuse. I loved that we were part of the Pulitzer Network. I'd like to thank all of you for coming tonight to celebrate the 2022 Reporting Fellows and their work. Our fellows come from 40 universities, including schools of public health, community colleges, HBCUs, and journalism schools. I am so proud of each and every one of you. And I'm thrilled to be here with you in person our first true Washington weekend in three years. <laughs> it's been really great to see other people's work and, and other people's passions manifest themselves in, in reporting. So for my project, I wanted to learn more about how farmers are experiencing climate change. Are they noticing these shifts in rainfall and are seeing increases in temperature? And how do these changes impact their crops? And so I think if you get to know people uh, before you maybe jump to trying to extract a story, I think that can be helpful. We cannot tell climate change stories without indigenous voices. The very people that link their identity to the climate around them. Just learning how everyone's reporting journey is very different. I think everyone learns a lot while they're in the field and just hearing from other fellows, like everyone's story just evolves as they go and get, and the most important thing is just talking to people um, and getting those stories and then it all comes together at the end. <laughs> I wanted to ask, how do you address this multi-layered aspect of reporting? A lot of it had to do with just interviewing people along the way and asking them what their experiences were, um, where they're coming from, why they believe what they believe. I'm meeting a bunch of really interesting people um, who are really kind and also very intelligent. And so I think the connection with the other fellows is like a big plus for me. Everyone's been really considered in the way they are approaching their subject matters and it's been um, I feel like I've learned so much from all of you, so thank you. If I had this idea to go to New Orleans and create this documentary, I don't see it happening without the Pulitzer Center. There's just so much potential for you to take these opportunities that you're finding and to look for ways of testing yourself and challenging yourself and trying new things. If you're the hardest worker in the room, you're gonna get the nugget. And to the Pulitzer Center, thank you, because I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels this way, but it has been the opportunity of a lifetime.
Yeah, so Washington weekend is a lot of fun. And as Kev mentioned in that video here last year was our first in-person one after two years of it being on Zoom. So it was just wonderful to see all the fellows have those opportunities to connect over coffee and, you know, just make those fun informal connections that aren't possible over Zoom. There we go. So now I want to go a little bit into the timeline of the fellowship. So the first step is to, of course, complete the application, which will be due by April 10th. Um, and there are a couple parts to the application, and I'll go into more detail on these. But you submit a 250-word proposal description. That's basically an overview of your project, the proposed angle, what you'd like to investigate, um, and just telling us a little bit about the story. We also ask for a budget, so how you plan to spend that $3,000 stipend where you to be receive it. Um, so whether that's travel costs, translator, um, hotel, meals, those kind of things, we just like to see how you plan to spend that money. Um, we'll also ask for some work clips, references, and a resume. Next, the center in Westchester will work together to select our fellow, um, and then we'll start the virtual orientation and onboarding in May. This is kind of the boring part with the paperwork and, you know, getting all the details in your travel books. Um, but that tends to happen in the May period because a lot of our fellows travel during the summer since they're students. Um, that's not a requirement that you travel for your reporting over the summer. We just tend to find that's what works best. So we try to do that onboarding in May. Um, you'll also be connected with the Pulitzer Center staff and all of us, as well as a special advisor for your project. This advisor will either have experience in the location you're reporting or on the topic that you're covering. Sometimes it's both if we can find the right person, um, but they will be a professional grantee that we've worked with before, and they'll be there to just help you make sure that you have everything that you need, that you're prepared to travel into the area. They can introduce you to local journalists to partner with. They can introduce you to contacts. Um, it's just a really wonderful mentoring relationship and something we really value. And then the reporting process begins. Um, a lot of our students tend to publish mid fall to winter. Um, our Washington weekend, as I mentioned, is in October. So most of our students have completed their reporting by then, but it's not a requirement. So we had students here last weekend who hadn't gone on their trips yet. Um, and they just told us about their pre reporting, what they expected to learn. Um, and it was still a really valuable experience. So the timeline is a bit flexible depending on what your plans are. And then for the deliverables of the fellowship, we ask you to produce a couple different things. You have your main story, which could take pretty much any format you'd like. This could be a written article. It could be a short documentary like Dylan did. It could be a podcast, a photo essay, lots of different things. We also require that there's a multimedia aspect. So if your main story is an article, we also require that you do a photo series or a short video or something like that to um, include a multimedia piece. But if your main project is like a documentary in of itself, then that's multimedia. So those two requirements are kind of combined. And then we also have you write a field note, which is kind of your personal reflection on your reporting experience. These are really fun to read because the students are reflecting in pretty much whatever way they want. We've had students write poems as their field notes. We've had students share about a source that they interviewed that didn't make it into their project, but that they wanted to talk about that experience or maybe a challenge they faced and how they overcame that. Um, so if you're interested in applying for the fellowship, I'd really encourage you to go read the field notes on our website. I feel like it teaches you a lot about what you can get out of the experience as a person beyond just like the journalism side of things. And then also we encourage you to pitch your deliverables to other news outlets. So everything that you produce has a guaranteed home on the Pulitzer Center website, but we also encourage you to pitch to other outlets and get published elsewhere to expand your reach. Um, so our editorial team can connect you with editors and news outlets um, to help out with those kind of things. Here are just a few of the places that some of our fellows have placed stories in the past months. Um, you can see there are local news outlets, national ones, video written, it all kind of depends on what your project is, who your target audience is, and we on staff can help you narrow in on who would be your this best. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Um, so now before I go into just a few things on our website and give you a few tips of what makes a good proposal, um, I would love to hear from Dylan a little bit about his fellow experience before he <laughs> <has> class. <laughs> Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Dylan Ortiz. I was the fellow, uh, Pulitzer Fellow for 2022. Um, I would just say in terms of my experience, uh, it definitely was, um, well, at least when it comes to coming up with a project idea, it's definitely something I would suggest something that you're passionate about. Um, for me, for example, the reason why I chose to go to New Orleans was first of all, because I wanted to stay local in terms of just like staying within the United States because it was like, a, it was COVID and just thinking about my budget. Um, I thought that I would be able to maximize as much as possible um, staying within the US, but also you, you can, Look at your budget different ways if you want to go internationally as well. I at first wanted to go to Iceland uh, to do a documentary on geothermal energy. So um, you can either one, but I chose New Orleans because I had been there once and I felt like it was much more of like a experience where it was more of like a touristy kind of time. I was there for like a football game, but I wanted to go back with a purpose and I knew that one of the things that was going on in New Orleans and continues to go on in New Orleans is the issue of food insecurity. I believe uh, New Orleans has the second highest household uh, rate of food insecurity in the country. And it was something that for, for me, it's just, it, 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 it just always crosses my mind. Like, how is it that we, the United States provides so much food, yet there's so many mouths that are, that are um, not fed on a daily basis. And we're one of the biggest producers of food waste in the world. So I just wanted to investigate that. And it was just from there that I proposed my idea. I ended up getting selected. I thought about my budget a lot. Thankfully, uh, WCC was able to provide me with film equipment. I made sure to protect it and take care of it. So that helped with like, you know, not having to rent out equipment. So that saved a lot of my budget because the majority of my budget went to um, staying at a hotel and um, Ubering mostly with my equipment around New Orleans. Um, and I guess it just depends on where you go, where your budget like priorities would go. Like, for example, if you go somewhere where you don't know the language, you'll have to think about budgeting or maybe a translator that that may uh, accompany you wherever you go if you're doing interviews, things like that, uh, flights, obviously. But in terms of just like, I would say the experience altogether, uh, to this day, it's still the, I guess, biggest experience that I had where I just learned the most for myself. It was the first time that I traveled by myself. It was the first time that I just was basically like an open world. It was just me and, and film equipment. And I shot everything. I mic'd up my, my talent. I asked questions. I made sure everything was in focus. I edited the whole thing. So it was, I just learned a lot about myself. And as someone who likes to, I guess, criticize myself a lot, I made sure that I, based on what I, I knew that what I was capable of, of doing, I knew that I put out my best work and I feel like the documentary that I was able to make um, is something that I'm very proud of and I'm planning to submit it to festivals and to publications. I haven't done so yet. I'm currently still, I transferred from WCC. I'm at Fordham now. So I've been busy doing just trying to get my bachelor's, but at the same time, I'm going to make sure that I keep pushing my documentary out. And it, it's definitely an, an invaluable experience that I, that I got, especially being able to go to Washington weekend. I was very glad that it was in person. You just get to hear stories from people all over the world, people who went to Cameroon, people who went to, uh, I think, Norway also, or Ireland. Um, Pakistan, or yeah, Pakistan, just like all around the world. You just, for me, I just wanted to hear other people's stories because I was just motivated to just keep kind of reporting because I, I still 
as much as I'm going into film and I want to tell like fiction stories and things like that, I still have that nonfiction bug, so to speak, that I still, there's still important stories that need to be told that I, um, that I believe that my time with the Pulitzer Center kind of just bonded or enhanced my, my fervor for, um, for journalism. So I would say, um, if anyone has any questions for me about my experience specifically, I'm happy to, to answer anything. And I believe uh, I can put my email in the chat if you ever want to uh, reach out to me with any questions. But yeah, I definitely a, a resource and I'm happy to answer any questions. What a great experience, Dylan. I do have two questions. Uh, for uh, maybe something that the students may want to know when I do share this with them. Um, one question is, um, and I'm glad you came back safely and I'm glad you had a wonderful experience. I wanna say that first. Um, one question is, are you um, given the money during the time of the trip or are you reimbursed during the time that you come back? From the trip, I think that would be a big question for them. Do they need to have all this upfront money to handle themselves during this experience? Right. So I believe the way that it was set up is that you receive. Well, once you like fill out, I guess, oh, um, like the um, documentation that you have to fill out, mm -hmm. and I think like the one thing that I had to do before, I guess, receiving like my first payment was to show that I had already purchased um, my plane ticket. Uh, and then from there you would get reimbursed. But the first payment I believe is 2000. And that's for you to use while you're there. And then once you submit your deliverables, that you would receive the other 1000. Mm -hmm. That's how, uh, that's how uh, the process was for me. Um, and I had one more question. Mm -hmm. um, how many steps can you tell us um, it took before you were accepted? Could you like outline like step by step? I did my application afterward. It took me about a week or so before I got information back. Do you remember those steps? Um, definitely the longest kind of time that I took throughout like the application process was brainstorming okay. um, with my, my idea. Because uh, you want to have like a, a good pitch idea first. Um, so, and then from there, I would say like build off of that. So mm -hmm. at first I had the idea of going to Iceland to investigate geothermal energy. And then um, I spoke to Professor Evans and we sat down and thought about the idea of going to New Orleans to uh, explore food insecurity. So from there, I kind of would just do a lot of research as to like, uh, you know, seeing what areas of New Orleans I particularly wanted to to go to. So one place that stood out was the Lower Ninth Ward, which is a neighborhood whose there's an article that was released um, where it said that like the entire neighborhood had one supermarket and and the Lower Ninth Ward is um, separated from the greater New Orleans by an industrial canal, which I actually passed when I was with one of the uh, people I interviewed. She took me around uh, all of New Orleans, like giving me a, a tour of the city. And we had, when we crossed into the Lower Ninth Ward, it was almost like 15 to tw like 20 minutes for that industrial canal to open and close back down for cars to keep passing. So it's definitely like, uh, a big inconvenience, especially if you need to go get food for your family. Thank you um, so much. But I would say that majority of the process would be just like researching. And I would also say that um, making sure that you have some sort of context before you, you even get accepted. Because that was one of the things that I did. Even before I got accepted, I reached out to some nonprofits in New Orleans introduced myself, went on Zoom calls, explained my idea and let them know, hey, I currently don't know if I'm gonna get accepted. If this happens, if I do get accepted, I just wanna let you know that this would be my plan. These would be the dates that I'm going to arrive 
and that we would hopefully be able to schedule some time to to do an interview okay. so it's definitely establishing some sort of context before you get there and since i had barely like essentially no context like no family or, or friends in new orleans i had to make sure that at least some uh of like basically two founders of two nonprofits i was able to to speak to and they were the, the ones that kind of were very open to allowing me to interview them and shoot b-roll of uh nice. of like the food distributions and things mm -hmm. like that so i would say yeah mostly just brainstorming your idea and the application process to my knowledge was pretty straightforward um in terms of just like uh maybe one thing that you should think about is like your budgeting are you going mm -hmm. to structure it that's mm -hmm. going again to like where you're going you might need to prior if you're going very far you might need to prioritize more money for your for your flight um okay. and and things like that so i would just go through the, the application it's pretty um straightforward thank you so much glenetta in yeah. terms of um in terms of the time frame from being uh the applications are due by april 10th michaela when do we anticipate that the that the the grantee would be notified is it like May, May 1st, I can't remember what your timetable is, I'm sorry. Yeah, it tends to be a two to three week turnaround. Um, I am thinking our April's pretty busy, so I'd say maybe three to four weeks. Um, by May 1st at the absolute latest, we would have a fellow selected, if not sooner. Um, we like to give them as much lead time as possible to start planning for travel and things like that. Great. Okay. That's what Thank I thought. you. Thank you. Yeah. And I know, Dylan, you have to head to class, but are there any quick last questions? Great, well, I know Dylan shared his email and I would encourage you all to check out his work on our website. Um, his documentary is there as well as some other um, work and pieces about his reporting. Um, and then also just while I'm on our website, I wanted to show you our um, the Westchester homepage that we have just a bit about our partnership. Um, and you can see, apologize for all the scrolling, but you can see all of our past fellows here at the bottom. Um, so I would encourage you to go check out all of the former fellows work. Um, also, we have a tab that is just reporting fellow stories and projects. So if you're looking for some inspiration, you can search by country, by issue, and see all of the stories that all of our fellows, not just 2022, but since I think our first fellow was 2014 or so. So lots of stories about all sorts of places on here. Um, and if you're looking for more inspiration, we also have an issues tab that has all of our reporting by professional grantees. Um, none, your reporting doesn't have to fit into one of these categories, but if you're trying to think about underreported topics, different communities, this is a great place to look for some inspiration. Um, you know, criminal justice, governance issues, food insecurity, climate change, lots of things on here. And then finally, we have our reporting fellowship homepage. This is a great place that we have resources. We have blogs about our past cohorts, um, videos from Washington Weekend. So if you just want to learn some more, you can definitely explore this. Um, lots of good things on our website. So then I just wanna leave you with a few tips about what makes a good proposal. Um, as Dylan mentioned, the development of this proposal is pretty time intensive on the front end, um, but that's because we really want you to have a clear understanding of what type of story you're trying to tell. Um, bye Dylan, thank you. <laughs> um, bye. And just doing all of this pre-reporting um, will help you narrow in on these things. So a few questions we, um, encourage you to consider are, is there a specific angle that you want to cover? Um, look at what reporting has already been done on this topic, on this community, on this country, um, and think about what angle could you bring to the story, whether it's your own personal intersection of identities that makes you uniquely poised to tell the story, or a question that you have, or something that you think hasn't been investigated. Um, we're really looking for like a clear focus. A lot of proposals tend to be pretty broad of like, I want to talk about climate change in Argentina. Well, there are about a million stories you could tell about that. So we're looking for like, what specifically is there a certain community that's being affected by climate change? Is there a um, company that's contributing to it? You know, things like that. Um, and with that, think about the significance. Why does your story matter? Um, if there was 
impacts that were to be have from your story? Like, what would you want it to be? Um, so thinking about why it needs to be told, who you're trying to reach, those kind of things. And then as Dylan mentioned, we also look for that pre-reporting. We really encourage you to identify sources in advance. Um, and what Dylan said was spot on of just reaching out saying, hey, I have this idea. I'm not accepted yet. I'm working on it, but would love to talk with you um, once I'm accepted or even just talking to them before to try to get a better understanding of the issue so you can narrow in on that angle. Um, just reaching out to people as well as doing some research numbers wise. Um, if there are a few key statistics that you might incorporate into your proposal, we love to see a good number or two that supports this is why you want to tell this story and it shows that you've done your research. And then make sure that you're considering all logistics and costs. Um, you can always apply for additional funding if you felt like the $3,000 stipend wasn't enough. So think about maybe other opportunities for that if you're struggling with costs, um, but look through, you know, what a translator would cost, approximate flight cost, the average night in a hotel, things like that in your budget. And then finally, we encourage you to consider the feasibility. Can you gain access to the people you need? And most importantly, is it safe? Um, we, for example, do not send students into active conflict zones. So we had a fellow in 2022 who reported on Ukrainian refugees in Turkey. Um, so it was a way that they were still able to tell a story about Ukraine, about the conflict, but it was safe for them um, because we want to make sure, of course, first and foremost, that you all are safe, especially if traveling internationally. Um, and Eric can help you kind of identify what areas are safe and maybe if the university has their own um, restrictions, because sometimes the colleges themselves won't send you certain places. So just thinking through all of those details very holistically um, to make sure it's a feasible and attainable project. That's what makes a really strong proposal. Um, and as I mentioned, that proposal description is only 250 words, um, which I know is a bit of a challenge. And that's the point. We want you to be able to tell your story um, and what you want to talk about very succinctly, because if you're able to write that succinctly, then we know that you have a very clear understanding of the project. Um, so really take some time to work out your proposal. Um, it'll be really beneficial for you in the end. And ultimately, if you are accepted, your proposal is a working document. So you're not bound to anything in there. You know, we can help work with your budget. We can help um, advise on ideas or sources to connect you to. So we'll workshop some things with you if we have some questions or some concerns. Uh, so it's always a living document. Things are always going to change in journalism. You might be on your reporting trip and have something happen. We've had that happen to fellows before and they had to completely change their project. And they ended up working up with us for like a whole nother year. Not super common, of course, not trying to scare you, but um, there's a lot of flexibility and just a lot of things that change. So our staff is always here to support you through those things. So yeah, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Before I do, I just wanted to plug um, a quick opportunity to talk to one more former reporting fellow. Um, Camilla DeChalice was a fellow in 2016, and she's now a reporter, um, a political reporter for the Washington Post here in DC. And she also does a lot of TikTok content for the Washington Post as well. Um, so her fellowship definitely helped launch her journalism career, and she'll be at Westchester on March 22nd for a Meet the Pros event. Um, so she'll be able to share a little bit more about how the connection she made through her reporting fellowship helped her professionally. She's had a lot of different great roles um, beyond just the Washington Post. So yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions here in our rest of our time. Hello. My name is Eric. Um, I would like to know, because you said you don't send people in certain places, uh, and I didn't see it up there. How do you guys feel about Cuba? Yeah, yes, with an asterisk. Um, we have sent fellows to Cuba before, I believe. Um, okay. There tends to be a necessity to have like heightened sensitivity on the topic that we're reporting on there, um, because there tends to be quite as not much press freedom. Um, so we would connect you with a grantee who's visited the area, um, but it's it's possible. Just I'd say with like an asterisk. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Eric, did you want to talk a little bit about your idea for Cuba? Did you have an idea? Um, well, I have this idea <laughs> because some uh, Havana gets kind of affected by kind of like 
when the boats come and people like the economy and stuff just, um, uh, come off the boats and they kind of like buy stuff and all that stuff and they just like kind of leave out of nowhere and and the, it makes it, the economy kind of uneven like taxi drivers get paid like five times the amount of a doctor there because like doctors get paid like like nothing and the taxi drivers get paid like you know american money all that they, they, they're in money exchange and all that stuff so i just want to kind of like point out the, you know the the kind of economic kind of imbalance i feel like or uh i don't know difference in it from other places uh i kind of haven't pinpointed yet but this is kind of a thing that i just kind of want to focus on and and also like why people come to cuba you know like i i also want to point out like don't come as a tourist you know come to support you know the people there don't come just to like look around come you know engage with people you know, uh, don't go to, I'm not saying don't go to hotels, but it's better to, you know, get uh, an Airbnb from a, a person that, a Cuban person that owns it and not from, like, because a European, a lot of Europeans buy out these houses and and they they kind of benefit from from Airbnbs and stuff like that. So I haven't really pinpointed it. it it's kind of like the economic factor and tourism with tourism and, and stuff like that. But um, right. I don't know if that's a good story or not. I, I think it's always good to start with personal interest. I think uh, if you're interested in an area and a topic and a certain story focus, that's where anyone would start with this um, and see where it takes you. I think that's the best approach. Um, and that's why we have um, the application process. That's why we have your teachers. That's why we have the Pulitzer advisees, right? They can help us shape and focus. But as I always say in my classes, the, the, the sharper, smaller focus you can get the better you'll feel about the story yourself and the better chance you'll have. You can always expand the story. Um, it's much harder to pull a story in, you know? It's better to have a narrow focus and make it wider as you go if you need to than to start here and bring it in as you go because you'll just be overwhelmed with material and ideas and uh, and, and uh, um, possibilities. And so do yourself a favor and keep it small. It can grow if it needs to, but I'd keep it small. I, I, Michaela, do you think that's I, a good idea? Yeah, I've been there a few times. I've been there like okay. three times already, and I know a few people there already. I've made a lot of different friends. Mm -hmm. I also have footage already. I also oh, cool. made sort of a short documentary for one of my classes okay. at WC. Uh, you know, but um, that's great. So uh, I'm going to try to focus on a kind of narrow it down. You know, yeah. perfect. Yeah. That's that's great. Uh, thank yeah, you, Eric. That's second, great. Thank you. I would second what Eric says. It's always easier to broaden out than narrow in, um, because if you're too broad, it's just going to be hard to find that focus. There are going to be a million people you could talk to, um, and it just like becomes too much of a challenge of opportunities. Um, but it sounds like you're already narrowing in on a focus there with the impact of tourism and cultural erasure and things like that. I think there are a lot of interesting stories to be told there. Um, so I would encourage you to talk to the people you know in Cuba, um, see what they feel like the biggest issues are. That'll help you too. Um, maybe brainstorm with the people on the ground. But yeah, I think that would be a great idea. Thank Hi, you. Tracy. I see you. Tracy's got her hand up. Hi. Hi, Tracy. Hi. I am not a journalism. Uh, I, I'm not doing journalism as a major. That's okay. Um, however, I have an interest in Haiti um, and the disparity of uh, basically the poverty is um, Haiti at this moment is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, probably the poorest country in the world, I would think. Um, one of the underreported uh, facts about Haiti is that there is no uh, sewage or sanitation pickup and there's no clean water. Um, Haitians buy little tiny plastic sacks full of clean water and because there's no sanitation pickup they throw them on the ground and then they end up in the rivers and in the oceans um, therefore and then the um, obviously the animal life eats the plastic it breaks down into little tiny microscopic pieces but it never decomposes as we know and then it's not only getting into our food supply, but it's killing the animals in the ocean. And it ends up, these little plastic bags ends up 
on all the beaches in the Caribbean, as well as in Southern Florida. So it is a, it's a major issue that is not being talked about. And because the government is the corruption, the poverty, um, it's very low on their, um, you know, it's a low priority. It's a non-existent priority because people in Haiti are just trying to survive. Even the wealthy, even the doctors, even the nurses um, are just trying to survive in Haiti. It's a huge problem. Um, inflation is about 30%. Doctors make $500 a month. Um, uh, teachers make $70 a month. And with inflation due to COVID and supply chains and also the coup, now um, they're even more impoverished. But this whole issue with recycling, and we focus on in the United States, especially locally, we focus on recycling in our neighborhoods, but we don't realize that it's actually a global issue and the impact that we make is so small. I think personally on the whole global um, on the on on global um, that these issues need to be brought to light. So I don't know if that because I'm not a journalism major, I don't know if that is something that I could do. Absolutely, and there is. I want to reiterate this again. I put it in material. This this fellowship is open to any major. It does not have to be a journalism or communication major at all. We've had terrific film majors win it uh, or be granted and let's say win. Um, we've had other opportunities. So sure, um, absolutely anyone can can uh, it can get this. And I, it sounds like you have got a real head start on what you would like to do and a really clear focus already. So I encourage everybody, uh, no matter what your major is or isn't, to think about this. It can only help you as you move forward in your career and your academic career. Thank you. Michaela, any thoughts about, about um, Tracy's uh, Haiti idea or anything like that? Do you feel like that's a, something the Pulitzer Center just generally would be interested in? Yeah, that sounds exactly up our alley. Um, I would just encourage you that even within that topic, there are a lot of stories that can be told uh -huh. about the chain of where the plastic ends up or the communications of how do we talk about recycling with people. So as Eric said, I would just encourage you to think more about how you want to hone in on um, what angle to approach it from but i think that sounds like a very very good start you're definitely on the right track absolutely it was exciting to listen to that's always a good sign right oh yes. thank you well, like, yeah. he's interested <laughs> Please, he's um, not just... great i look we look forward to hearing more about it um hey zeus i see your hand is that right uh yeah hi hi, thank you. hi. i just had a question about like uh projects that are partially shot um so Basically, yeah, um, is the, like, I, I'm curious if the fellowship um, might be a, a thing to explore, mainly for the mentorship. Like, I'm curious how you, how the uh, fellowship makes connections. Uh, how, do, how do they connect students to mentors? Um, mainly because there's, I, there's a project that I sort of started and then realized that there was a, a it was initially about sort of um, bullying from an institutional perspective. And so looking at different, um, like an over increase in policing and not enough in sort of like uh, counselors, that was the initial sort of um, um, focus um, of the project. And so we were interviewing students about like, basically kind of looking at and from an institutional perspective how many teachers saw what was happening but didn't intervene until it was too late and then as we were doing interviews it sort of became there was also this other thing that started com coming up which was student surveillance and ways in which because there's so much military reliance um to intervene at the stage of physical violence but not beforehand so I started learning more about sort of like uh, how different students are tracked um, and, and sort of like not just from a state perspective, but just like from a federal legal perspective. Anyways, so there's a ton of 
sort of almost preliminary interviews for an issue that when I first started, I thought it was like, oh, it has, you know, it, this is something that's like schools sort of um, could address with counselors. And, and that still is, uh, there's still um, people working on that. But then there's other perspective about um, like predictive software. Like there's a lot of ways in which they're trying to implement sort of like who's, which student is going to become a criminal. There's a lot of really just interesting stuff that almost feels like a like a like a really intense branch that's coming up in this project that I haven't finished. So I just had a question about um, I guess uh, this I stopped working on this in 2019 and then because the pandemic just sort of was such an up and um, but I think I would benefit from connecting to like I guess uh, like, because it feels like uh, there's a lot of research into it and there's a lot of um, work sort of that seems, it's like, I guess I'm not sure how a journalist might bring this into fruition, into something. And so that's kind of, um, I'm curious about like how, like the fellowship, if the fellowship makes sense or if I should do something else, but yeah. I think mentor, yeah. I don't know if I'm asking my question. No, uh, I completely understand. And I think my like, comment would be um, we always like to support students who are doing new work so we're not gonna like reimburse for a project you already did but what it sounds like is that you have a whole new project kind of waiting to be explored um, so I think that this would be a perfect opportunity for you especially if you're looking to be connected a bit more with the journalist um, on that perspective of things um, I'm gonna drop in the chat we actually just did a story that I'd encourage you to check out um, on this company oh, called Social Sentinel, who is was hired by lots of campuses. And there's actually been a lot of campuses who are now dropping them because of this reporting that came out. Um, but basically it's this like AI system that was in theory scanning for like social for mental health concerns um, and alerts, but it turns out that it was really being used to monitor like protest and things like that, especially during Black Lives Matter. Um, so for example, you could be connected with this um, grantee as an advisor. How we make those connections is truly once we see your proposal, um, we start to look through our grantees who have reported on similar issues. Um, we connect with them to see their availability and willingness because we, of course, want them to be eager to help you as well. Um, so yeah, I like for example, they could be one of your advisors in theory. Um, so it's a bit of a process when we pair them. Um, but we try to find someone who is similar in topic. Um, but yeah, I feel like, I mean, I'm curious if Eric has thoughts, but I feel like this would be a great opportunity for you. No, I, I completely agree. And I think that the mentorship that you get when you're a fellow is one of the, one of the great benefits here. And uh, it would vary, of course, depending on the story and depending on the mentor and the mentee. Um, but I've had many past uh, grantees talk about what a fulfilling relationship that was and how much they learned. And that sounds like what you would uh, benefit from as well as bringing your own original voice to it. Having someone who's been in the field and done it is always a, a great thing. And of course, you have us here at WCC. We're, we're, we're conduits and to get you to the Pulitzer Center and we're here to help with questions and focus um, during this part of the process. So you've got a lot of support. And that's one of the things that makes this a special program. Yeah, and I feel like one of the most beneficial things you can do when you're developing your proposal is to go connect with Eric or one of your other professors and bounce ideas off of them, talk through things, because they've seen what makes a good proposal and a good project, so they might be able to help flag some things for you to consider that you hadn't thought of before. Um, so definitely utilize your resources. I think one of the, I think the things that make a project really pop um, are um, an obvious interest and obvious passion, but also someone who's able to convey the, and I know it's it's only 250 words, and I know that's not much, but if you're able to convey that you have a vision and you have an, a, a solid idea already, um, that just gives everyone so much more to work with, as opposed to um, something that feels amorphous and a little, a little, a little, a little raw. You know, you want it to be as clear as you can. Maybe that's the best word. Like I noticed that in the chat, Tanvir was mentioning about you could tell the the. Um, the Cuba story through the eyes of a taxi driver and that kind of thing, that kind of detail, um, just as an example, is the kind of thing that might help 
not only give you direction and vision, but help the person looking over the application see it as well. So that's Eric, that, that's my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Tanvir, you have thought about that? Yeah, I just want to add to it. Just try to tell the story through a human perspective. You know, it always makes it a little bit more interesting to tell it from from a human perspective, perspective as like the recycling story. You know, finding someone that's been impacted by it, it's a, a bit more powerful than just talking about recycling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like focus on a doctor or something and a taxi driver. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and just show the difference, and, and that's a that's a great story right there. You know? They paid forty dollars a month, by the way, right. doctor. <laughs> and I was thinking about I was thinking about the Haiti story with the little little plastic bag and like following the plastic bag at the little it's various stops along the journey right that, that was the overreaching sort of visual idea if you're going to do a visual piece so if if you can make the person who's looking at the application see it what you see using C as the the vernacular here then I think that that would always help you um, I see that Jenny has her hand up Professor Evans. Yeah, I was just going to say with his with Jesus's idea. That you know, you might find. I know that you already have footage of students who were protesting as part of Black Lives Matter. Have any of those students, you know, been affected, or do they think they've been affected by, um, you know, the sort of AI uh, tracking? So that you could kind of, if if you followed one of your um, subjects who may have been affected, then you'd have a very kind of personal story. Of course, they may not know if they've really been tracked, but that's your opportunity to kind of open open up and say, well, this has happened and that's happened to other people. And, you know, kind of, you may never be able to answer that question, but you're using someone you know who you've already got footage of and a connection with to kind of enter the story. Yeah, we find that any sort of like personal case study that can be a reflection for like a statistic or a number that you found in your research is always a more effective way to convey that than just giving the statistic of, this many people are affected by X, Y, Z, like tell us the story of one of those people. And then you pull in that statistic to show the range of the issue. Um, but yeah, I think those people centered stories are always so effective. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Great. Yeah, That's really great advice, Michaela. Any other questions or thoughts or, or anything you want to add? Like I said, we'll, I put every I put all the links in the chat multiple times. We'll post this video on the normal channels. Um, you'll be able to get information hopefully through a myriad of sources. Um, so we look forward to getting the applications. And just because the deadline is April 10th doesn't mean you can't send them in early, of course. So keep that in mind as well. Um, EL. Um, uh, also, what if uh, one doesn't have kind of money to kind of put up front to buy a ticket to do certain things, you know, mm -hmm. how does yeah, that? Yeah, we can, we can work with you on that, um, especially like given the ticket, like the flight cost and stuff. Um, we always do reserve at least part of the stipend that we don't pay you until the deliverables are produced, um, just to have, you know, that motivation to produce deliverables. Um, mm -hmm. But we can give a good chunk up front, um, and we're also willing to work with individual situations. So our team can adapt and make special um, considerations depending on an individual's needs. Thank you. Yeah. We don't want that to be a barrier in any way. Thank you. Well, it's just about noon. That might be a good time to stop unless we got something else. Any thoughts or any closing thoughts from, from anybody else? Well, obviously you're here because you're interested and I hope you see that interest through. I wanna give a big thank you to Michaela. Um, she is a fountain of knowledge and support and uh, she's here for all of us as as are all of us here at WCC for you who are interested in. So thanks to you, Michaela for coming. Thanks to all of you coming and uh, have a great day. And like I said, we can't wait to see what you come up with. Excited to read everyone's proposals. Absolutely. Thanks everybody. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.